I've started this series on Passover, and uh, I, I, I hope it's been a blessing to you. And I just want to quickly recap what I said last Sunday, but before I'm going to get into this morning's word, which is going to be a little bit lengthy. So please get your pen, get your paper, write down, because you're going to need it. Um, and I started with this, and I introduced you. Uh, Goshen was a very specific location in Egypt. When Jacob, together with his sons, came to Egypt, and Egypt at the time was under the governorship of Joseph. Actual fact, Joseph said this. You see, this is when God elevates you in your grace. Promotion comes, doesn't come from the east, the west, the north, and the south, but it comes from the Father above. Joseph says that in that same, uh, uh, I think it's Genesis 12 or 45 now, I'm just saying. He says, God has made me father to Pharaoh. Can you imagine that? He's not even, he's not even the boss. He's not even the kingpin. He's not the king. He's not the, but God has made him, Joseph, father to Pharaoh. In other words, if you flip that, there must have been something in the life of Joseph that Pharaoh recognized and acknowledged for him to be the father or, or to have the function as a father in the life of Pharaoh. Do you hear what I'm saying? God is amazing. You're going to see this morning. God, I don't want to go ahead of myself. Sometimes the one that you think God will choose is not the one. Or through tradition that we think maybe this is the one. God can skip that person. He's done it through history. So, God made him Pharaoh to, to, to uh, a father to Pharaoh. That's now Joseph. And in this location called Goshen, we find that they received protection from the plagues that overtook Egypt. And also, later on when there was an angel of death that passed over the Egypt, we find that the whole of Israel, the Son of God, remember, was protected. Now, some specific, specific instructions on how to protect ourselves when the judgment of God comes upon a nation in the world uh, can be extrapolated from this whole passage in, in, in Genesis. And remember that we are a holy nation within a nation. Although we're in this nation, but we're a holy nation. The church of the living God, the son of God, the temple, the Zion, the new Jerusalem, all are metaphors of the kingdom of God and the church of the living God. So while we live in a nation, we are a holy nation. We are a special people. We are a peculiar people. Why? What makes us so special is because we have the spirit of God, of the living God on the inside of us. Amen. Somebody say yes. So, and then we find in Genesis 45, verse uh, 4, it says, And Joseph said to, the, to his brothers, Please come near to me. This is when Joseph eventually revealed himself to his brothers after all these years, after they sold him, and they thought, in actual fact, they don't know what happened to him, and all of a sudden, here is Joseph right in front of them. He's the governor of the whole of Egypt. He's father to Pharaoh. God has elevated him. He's the one that's selling grain to the world. And all of a sudden, he reveals himself to his brothers. I think they must have been scared spitless. They thought, oh, now we're going to get a hiding of our lives. This guy's going to put us in prison. But that was not his attitude. Remember what he said. He said, God sent me ahead of you to save lives. That's always the attitude of a servant of God, the positive although you might go through the negative. And he says this, And Joseph said to his brothers, Please come near to me. So they came near. Then he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold in Egypt. And so we find that Joseph is a picture of Christ, and the brothers are a picture of the body of Christ. Joseph is the head, and the brothers are the body. And what we find there that's important is this was his request to them. Please come near to me. So Goshen represents the principle of drawing near or staying near. Joseph represents Christ, who is full of grace and truth. Christ is also uh, represented by gifts in the body or those whom he sends. Remember, if you receive those I've sent, you receive me. That is Ephesians 4, John 13, all these scriptures. Um, staying near is to remain in the proximity or in closeness to Christ and to those that he sent. Are you with me? Matthew 10, 40, 
He who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. And we find that Paul was received as an angel of God in Galatians 4.14. And my trial, which was in my flesh, you did not despise or reject it, but you received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. When we say near, when we stay near to those whom God has sent and receive them as angels of the Lord, then we receive provision and protection from the Lord. And Goshen means drawing near, drawing near. Okay. It is a dwelling relationship. And therefore the Bible also says that we are joined, we are joined to the Lord as one spirit. Remember, we are also joined to the Lord, which is one spirit. And then I mentioned the first four benefits which came by drawing near. Uh, Goshen is the provision, uh, is a provision in the time of famine is the first one. Second one, you will become a great nation. It's a fulfillment of covenantal promise. And we know that the Bible is full of promises that God will fulfill in our lives once it gets activated in Goshen. Are you with me? The third one is resurrection life, which means he will revive that which seems dead. God will revive that which seems dead to you. Some of your dreams... Some of your passions, some of the things that you desire, some of the things which you felt the Lord gave you. You know, there's a time in my life when I, I received a lot of prophetic words. And then there's a time in my life when it seems like you go through a wilderness, there's nothing. And it seems like those stuff has died. And sometimes you wondered whether those prophetic words were really true. Yes. You think to yourself, well, maybe that was just the beetroot salad the guy ate last night. Because I can't see. I still have prophecies that I'm, I'm holding on to. I remind God. I remind him in this week of it. Um, of prophecies that he gave me that still not come to fruition. Most of my prophecies have come to fruition. Most of them. But, but the, there comes a time where you feel that thing is dead. And I want to say to you, God will revive it. Amen. At the right time. The seed must fall on the ground first and die. But God will revive it. Hear the word of the Lord. God will revive it. So resurrection life. Because it, to Jacob, it seemed like Joseph was dead. Because he saw the, the tunic of many colors that was dipped in blood. And he thought, my son has, di has died. Been eaten by ravaging wolves or whatever. Wild animals. And all of a sudden, here is Joseph presenting himself to his father. Hallelujah. Your Whatever has been dead will present itself to you. Amen. Say amen. amen. And then obviously the fourth thing we spoke about is the best of the land, which is the Hebrew word tup, which means uh, uh, property, goods, goodness, fairness, beauty. It is a desirability of enjoyment. God, I will give you the best of the land. Some of you still need to see that. Hallelujah. Come on. I see what God is about to show you the best of the land. We stay near in Goshen. God is setting us up. Listen to what I'm saying. God is setting us up. Say amen. amen. To, for the best of the land. Listen, you don't have to figure it out. You don't have to make it work. God will make it work. Once you start to activate your brain to see how you can figure this thing out, it will not work. This thing is a, this thing is a divine supernatural orchestration by the Spirit of God. God will manifest this. God will make this thing work. Amen. Okay, so this morning we, we're going to go for 5 to 12, okay? Are you ready? So the fifth one is that you, one of the benefits, fifth benefit that you find um, with Goshen is abundant life. Abundant life. Genesis 47 verse 27. So Israel dwelt in the land of Egypt, in the country of Goshen, and they had, they had possessions there and grew and multiplied exceedingly. Goshen was a place of possession, growth, and multiplication in abundance. While we all want to experience growth in quantity and quality, we must believe, I say we must believe, that we will receive it in abundance because we serve a God of more than enough. That's what the Bible says. That's one of his names, a God of more than enough. Not just enough, more than enough. That's why you'll find an apostolic when we eat food or whatever, there's always more than enough. My wife always says, you cook for a lot of people. There's only a few people that come to you. But that's the grace of an apostolic. There's always more than enough. Amen. 
So Isaiah 30 verse 23 says this. Then you will give the rain for your seed with which you sow the ground and bread of increase. The bread of the increase of the earth. It will be fat and plentiful in the day your cattle will feed in large pastures. Come on, people, we need to see this. I tell you, the biggest sin in life is to limit the unlimited God. And we limit God, you know how? Through our minds, our thinking, through our abilities. We want to bring God into our world. No, we have to enter into His world, His sphere, His metron. There was numerical growth of persons and possessions that took place in Goshen. Exodus 1 verse 7. But the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly. Now this doesn't mean, Tina, that you have to have 20 children. That's not what I'm saying. Please. What I mean, it's, it's a metaphor. Tinas, uh, say a metaphor. Thank you. <laughs> Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly multiplied and grew exceedingly mighty, and the land was filled with them. Wow. Isn't that wonderful? So God promised the nation of Israel fruitfulness of the womb and the land and of their livestock. In Deuteronomy 7, verse 12 to 14, then it shall come to pass because, watch this, watch this, watch this. The media highlighted this morning. Because you listened to these judgments, which actually means the commands of the Lord. You've listened to the instruction. You've listened to the principles. And keep and do them. Do you see that? There has to be an activation of them. There must be a doing of them. Not just a knowing, a doing. Do you see that? That the Lord your God will keep you, keep with you the covenant and the mercy which he swore to your fathers. And he will love you and bless you and multiply you. He will also bless the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your land, your grain, your new wine, your oil, the increase of your cattle and the offspring of your flock and the land of which he swore to your fathers to give to you. This is still something that's going to come. This is still something in the future. Remember? Because they were still in Egypt here. You shall be blessed. Watch this. Above all. All people, there shall not be a male or female barren among you or among your livestock. Say amen. amen. This kind of growth is described as abundant life in Christ. People, we are living mediocre lives. Well, I'm not going to include myself. Many people are living mediocre lives. And God wants us to live abundant. Amen. Ephesians 3 verse 20 now to him who is able to do what? Exceedingly, watch, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. Do you see that? So Jacob and his family were seeing the exceeding and abundant grace of God working in their lives. Staying near, Joseph allowed them to prosper in the time of famine. Goshen principles initiated abundant life blessings upon them. They had more than enough and were multiplying while the Egyptians were, were buying grain from them, eventually selling their livestock and land to get bread. That's Genesis 47. Go read it. The Egyptians ended up being taxed for their lives and their lands. Yes, the Egyptians were taxed for their lives and their land, not the Israelites. Jacob and his family were being blessed and prospered. So these were two coexisting realities, one living by buying and selling, and the other just by staying near to grace. Do you see that? Hallelujah. So abundance and abundantly or exceedingly is associated with much, many, great, more numerous, more than enough. Hallelujah. Christ came so that we may have life and have it more abundantly. John 10.10. 10. Also, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. This abundant nature is seen in the character of God. Even in God's character displays it. God is abundant in creation. 
when he creates. That's Psalm 18 verse 14, 1 Kings 18 verse 41. Now in Genesis chapter 120, it says, Then God said, let the waters abound with an abundance of living creatures. And let birds fly above the earth across the face of the firmament of the heavens. So God created in abundance. Now there's a few others. God is abundant in mercy. That's Numbers 14 verse 18. Nehemiah 9 verse 27. Psalm 86 verse 15. 1 Peter 1 verse 3. This is a long study, people. Lots of homework. Psalm 86 verse 5. For you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive and abundant in mercy to all those who call upon you. Then God is also abundant in kindness. That's Nehemiah 9 verse 16 to 17. I'm just going to read to you the last part of 17. But you are God ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abundant in kindness, and did not forsake them. Another thing, God is abundant in justice. That's Job 37 verse 23. As for the Almighty, we cannot find Him. He is excellent in power, in judgment, and abundant justice. He does not oppress. God is also abundant in loving kindness. Listen, I can carry on and carry on and carry on. The whole book is full of it. God is abundant in loving, loving kindness. That's in Jonah 4 verse 2. It says this. Um, For I know that you are gracious and merciful God, slow to anger, abundant in loving kindness, one who relent from doing harm. God is also abundant in forgiveness. That's Isaiah 55 verse 7. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. Do you see that? We are recipients of the abundant grace of God. Paul recounts the grace of God in his life. He, he, he speaks about the fact how gracious God has been to him when he says this in 1 Timothy 1 verse 12 to 14. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me, that's grace, because he accounted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, although, although I was formerly a blasphemer, a prosecutor, an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did not ignorant, I did it in ignorantly in unbelief. And watch this verse 14. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love, which are in Christ Jesus. Do you see this? And also Romans 5 verse 17. For if, for if by the one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Come on, abundance, 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 abundant life. Now, you will also find abundance is all over the scripture. Remember when they, when they were building the tabernacle, there was an abundance of offering given. Let me just give you Exodus 36, verse 5 to 7. And they spoke to Moses saying, the people bring much more than enough for the service of the work which the Lord commanded us to do. Verse 7, for the material that they had was sufficient for all the work to be done. Indeed, too much. That speaks of abundance. Then also 2 Chronicles 31, verse 4 to 5. As soon as the command, verse 5, was circulated, the children of Israel brought in abundance the first fruits of grain and wine, oil and honey, and of all the produce of the field. And they brought in abundantly the tithe of everything. And we even find that with Nehemiah, he provided in abundance at his table. When they came and sat at his table, that's Nehemiah 5, verse 70 to 18. And at my table were 150 Jews, Lord Jesus, and rulers, besides those who came to us from the nations around us. So besides the other guys. Do you see that? Now that which was prepared daily was one ox and, and six choice sheep. Also fell were prepared for me, and once every ten days, an abundance of all kinds of wine. Yet in spite of this, I did not demand the governor's provision, because the bondage was heavy on this people. Hallelujah. 
So the abundance of God becomes evidence of evidence in our lives through generosity. Hallelujah. Come on. It cannot be seen otherwise. It must come through generosity. You'll see it later. So the abundant life is not an opulent, luxurious, swanky, or posh lifestyle. That's not what it's about. Abundance is associated with superior quality. Superior quality. Greatness. And having more than enough. Hallelujah. It is a life of having a cup that runs over. Watch this now. But this abundance is for something specific. Say specific. It is for good works. That's what the Bible says. 2 Corinthians 9 verse 8 to 9. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you. That you always having all sufficiency in all things. Say all things. Come on, say all things. Some of you are lacking in some things. Sufficient all things may have an abundance, watch this, for every good work. Do you see that? As it is written, he has dispersed abroad, he has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Your righteousness can endure forever by your good works. Do you see that? It is for dispersion or distribution. Hallelujah. We have more than enough so that, we, so that we can become distributors of God's goodness through our good works. That's what he's after. So God doesn't need us. Watch this. God does not need us to advertise how wealthy he is. The Muslims will beat you. Listen. It's for a specific reason. We're not out there to brag about this stuff. God gives it to us for every good work. So there must be purpose. Many people want an abundance. Oh, can, I, can I be frank? Free. God can't trust you with a ten rand in your pocket. God will not trust you with a million. It doesn't start with the millions. Many people say, Lord, give me the million and I'll show you what you'll do. No, no. Show me what you do with the ten. We have to be faithful in the little. Many people want God to bless them. Then they want to become a blessing. No, no, become a blessing with what you already have. I've walked out of restaurants without my shoes. I've done silly stuff to many people. Pastor looked at me and said, it's the most beautiful pair of shoes I, that I've ever seen in my life. I said, what's your size? He said, 10. I said, well, there's a pair of shoes. That's my wife. It's for every good work. God make me. Let's get real. I go into Saks Fifth Avenue, New York. And I saw this pair of shoes. I love it. And I say, you know what? I've got the time, I've got the money. I want that pair of shoes. And I fit it, and it was perfect. So the guy took it, he's at the back there, busy ringing it up or whatever, and I went and I paid for it, he gave me the back, and I took it and I went home. Put it in my suitcase, that's just before I came back to South Africa. Flew all the way to South Africa. Come to South Africa. One, lo and behold, we're in a conference here with John Ellie. I want to wear my shoes, and I put my foot in the shoe, and the shoe's too big for me. They gave me the wrong size. I said, John, what is your size? He says, Ben, 11. I said, I've got a pair of shoes for you. And I gave him the pair of shoes. What did he say? It's the first time in how many, a long time that, he's, that he wear these uh, laced-up shoes because he wore these lacquer loafers, you know. And he was so proud of the pair of shoes. So God had him in mind. And he made me fly to New York to go shop for him. It's not fair. I'll have to go back. <laughs> Let me tell you, it's, God is a genius. He knows what he is doing. If you can just become a channel of this abundant life of God, have open hands. You, that's how he came into the world. That's how you're going to go out of this world. Do you hear what I'm saying? You will find that the heavens will open over you. And God will bring it out of the north, the east, the south, the west. Listen, there's no money in heaven. Did you hear what I'm saying? It will come from the north, the south, the east, or the west. Not out of the heavens. 
There's no money in heaven. You know that. You know that. I hope so. But God will bring it to you, even though he might use the ravens. But the fact is, God will make sure that it will come to you in whatever form or manner. But you have to understand, it's always for a purpose. And I said this before, whenever God gives me money, I always ask him, the first thing I do, what is it for? Because God gives bread, God gives seed to the sower, he gives bread to eat, but he also gives the increase of the storehouse. So what is it for? Lord, is this to put away? Is this to eat or is this to sow? And you have to find out, discern what it is for. Many people eat their seed. And many sow their bread. Yes. Ask me. Are you still there? So God doesn't need us to advertise how wealthy he is. While we must be excellent representatives of the kingdom of God, we must not be seduced into worldly lust of things. Abundance supplies what is lacking so that they might be, watch this. You're not going to like this word, but here it comes. Equality. I know we're living in South Africa, but let me give you scripture. 2 Corinthians 8 verse 13 to 15. For I do not mean that others should be eased and you burdened. There's these guys that start giving Paul stuff. Verse 14. But by an equality that now at this time your abundance may supply their lack. And their abundance also must supply your lack that there may be equality. As it is written, he who gathers much had nothing left over and he who gathered let little had no lack. Do you see that? That's always the mind of God. <clears throat> Solomon was wealthy and had everything in abundance but realized that it was vanity. That's what he said. Abundance is not to be laid up but to be dis distributed. Remember that man, Luke 12, he's in verse 15 to 21 and he said to them, Take heed and beware of covetousness. Listen, I'm not talking about saving for your old age and all that stuff. I'm talking about people that are stingy. Stingy. Say stingy. Take heed of, uh, and beware of covetousness for one's life does not consist in the abundance of things he possesses. Then he spoke a parable to them saying the ground um, of a certain rich man yielded plentiful and he thought within himself saying what shall I do since I have no room to store my crops so he said I will do this I will, uh, I will pull down my barns and build greater and there I will store all my crops and my goods and I will say to my soul soul you have many goods laid up for many years take your ease eat drink and be merry verse 20 but God said to him fool this night your soul will be required of you then whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasures for himself and is not rich towards God. He lost next for Nachbeti. That's an old family saying. You give things away. I'm not sentimental. A lot of people are very sentimental with goods. No, it's not necessarily bad, but that can form a bondage in your life. You hear what I'm saying? That's what God wants to make us. You see, currency is something that flows. That's why it's a current. It's a currency. So we have to be, become channels of where God's goodness can flow towards others. And also for, for kingdom purposes. So Goshen is a position that prepares us to receive exceedingly great possessions and to see growth. This is the abundance of God in the midst of a worldly system even though it might fail, or even though it might be in famine. But it's the abundance of God manifesting towards God's people. We are God's treasure, uh, treasure hidden in this world. You are. We must express the abundant life of God to this world. Hallelujah. Now, the sixth thing is, still have to have six more. One of the, the six benefits is this, is the elevation to firstborn status. The elevation. In Genesis 48, verse 5, and now your two sons, I love this, you must see this, it's beautiful. Talking to Joseph, Ephraim and Manash, who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt, are mine. As Reuben and Simeon, they shall be mine. 
So Jacob speaking to Joseph, your two sons that were born in Egypt were now regarded as the first two sons of Jacob. These sons were now adopted or placed as sons of Jacob. They also received the firstborn privilege in 1 Chronicles 5 verse 1. Now the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, he was indeed the firstborn. Watch this, Reuben. He was indeed the firstborn. But because he defiled his father's bed, his birthright was given to the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel. Do you see it? Now all of a sudden, the son of Israel. So that the genealogy is not listed according to birthright. Do you see that? That's where I said God can switch stuff around. Hallelujah. This is about us being placed in the family of God. The Israelites were given the privilege of adoption and several other privileges by promise. You can find that in Romans 9, verse 3 to 5. Say, who are Israelites to whom pertain the adoption? They were adopted. Do you see that? So also, Gentiles have also received this privilege in Christ. In Ephesians 1, verse 3 to 6, you know that. Verse 5, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ himself. So we were also adopted. We have that firstborn right. So drawing near to God, staying near to grace, gives us access to our firstborn status in Christ Jesus. Among the Israelites, the firstborn son possessed special privileges. And some of them, he succeeded his father as the head of the house and received as his share of inheritance a double portion. Now Israel was the Lord's firstborn, and you can see that in Exodus 4 verse 22, and, thus, and was thus entitled to special privileges as compared with other people. Jesus Christ is described as the firstborn in Romans 8, 29, Colossians 1, verse 15, Hebrews 1, verse 6. An application of the term that may be traced back to Psalm 89, verse 27, where the Messiah is referred to as the firstborn of God. So Romans 8, 29, one again. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among or in many brethren. That is you. So Christ is the firstborn in many brethren. As the corporate son, we have received the birthright in Christ. As the firstborn, we receive the right to represent God, our heavenly Father, on the earth or to the earth. Goshen is the location or position where this privilege is activated in your life. When we draw near to God, we begin to see more of ourselves in the likeness and image of Christ. The privilege and blessing of the firstborn is seen also in several characteristics. I'm just going to mention a few uh, of these uh, characteristics that we can see in a firstborn's life. Number one, you'll find that that, one, that firstborn has been bestowed blessings. Blessings. The, bir- the birthright of the firstborn consists in the first place of a double portion of what this father had to leave, of what his father left. This probably means that he had a double share of such property as could be divided. You can see that the whole Bible is full of it. Deuteronomy 21 verse 17. But he shall acknowledge the son of the unloved wife as the firstborn by giving him a double portion of all that he has. For he is the beginning of his strength. The right of the firstborn is his. So one of the rights of the firstborn in your life is that of blessing. And a double blessing, not just a normal blessing. Come on, say double blessing. The second thing we can find of the benefits of a firstborn status is inherited authority. Okay? The firstborn succeed the father's official authority, received it. Moses, as the firstborn in his household, was sent by Jehovah with authority to deliver the Israelites out of Egypt. God placed in Moses' hand a rod which symbolizes authority. We who are the firstborn have received authority to the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus had all authority. Remember? Matthew 28, 18. And Jesus came and spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Jesus had all the privileges, all the privileges, all of the privileges of heaven and of earth. And he had all the capacity and influence. Now the blessing does not flow when we do not understand our inherent authority. Do you hear what I'm saying? We need to understand our authority. There was no jurisdiction that could control Jesus. We who are born out of him have the same authority. However, we must understand our responsibility in the executing of that authority. 
Well, authority comes with authority comes responsibility. Jesus was responsible. Watch this now. Matthew 7, verse 29. For he taught them as one having authority. Now, that authority is not only power, but the responsibility to do it right. And not as the scribes, he says. Luke 4, verse 32. And they were astonished at his teaching, for his word was with authority. Watch this. You serve with authority. Do you hear this? You serve with authority. Luke 22, verse 25 to 26. And he said to them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors, but not so among you. On the contrary, he who is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he who governs, he as he who serves. So if you want to govern, be as one that serves. That's what the Lord says. The third thing is that you find with your firstborn status is respect. The firstborn who inherited the birthright had great respect from his brothers. The father of the household gave the firstborn authority over his brothers. Therefore, they respected him. You can read the whole story about David, how he respected his eldest brother when he went down to war. That's in 1 Samuel 17, verse 28 to 30. I'm not going to read all these scriptures. There's too many of them. You find that Eliab, his oldest brother, how he spoke to David, and how David respected him. When, Jesus, when Joseph was going to be killed by his brothers, it was Reuben, the firstborn, who stepped in and saved him. And all of the rest of the brothers listened to him, adhered to him, and respected him. Let me just give you that one. Genesis 37, verse 90 to 22. Then they said to one another, look, this dreamer is coming. Come, therefore, let us now kill him and cast him into some pit, and we shall say some wild beast has devoured him. We shall see what will become of his dreams. Verse 21. But Reuben... But Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands. And he said, let us not kill him. And Reuben said to them, shed no blood, but cast him into the pit which is in the wilderness, and do not lay a hand on him, that he might deliver him out of their hands and bring him back to his father. His intention was to save him. The brothers respected Reuben, therefore. They honored his decision. Watch this. Jacob respected his elder brother Esau in Genesis 33, verse 10. And Jacob said, No, please, if I have now found favor in your sight, then receive my present from my hand, inasmuch as I have seen your face as though I had seen the face of God, and you were pleased with me. You see the respect? How he honored him? Job had the respect of the community. Look at this. In Job 29, verse 7 and 11. When I went out to the gate, this is Job, by the city, when I took my seat in the open square, the young men saw me and hid, and the age arose and stood. The young men hide themselves, and the age stood. The princes refrained from talking and put their hand on their mouth. The voice of the nobles were hushed, and their tongues stuck to the roof of their mouth. When the ear heard, then it blessed me, and when the eye saw, then it approved me. Do you see, Job? He had respect from the community. As firstborn sons of God, our counsel must command the respect of the young and the old. People of influence and stature must respect the wisdom that proceeds from the mouth of the firstborn sons of God. The fourth one, one of the benefits of the firstborn, as a firstborn son is that you become the template or the pattern. The firstborn son of God, as the firstborn son of God, we become the pattern or a template. Jesus Christ was the pattern son that left us a template or example to follow. Templates become the standard to others for them to follow. 1 Peter 2 verse 21, 23. For to this you were called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Do you see that? Who committed no sin, nor was deceitful found in his mouth. Who when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judged righteously. That is the pattern. Christ left a pattern of living 
in complete obedience to the Father because he had to learn obedience to the things that he suffered. Hebrews 5, verse 8 to 9. Christ left a pattern also of love. John 15, verse 9 to 14. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. Go read the rest of the scripture. 1 John 3, verse 16 to 17. But this we know, by this we know love, because he laid down his life for us. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. For whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shut up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? The fifth benefit of a firstborn is headship. Headship. The first one became head of the family and thus succeed to the charge of the family's property, become responsible for the maintenance of the youngest sons, the widow or the widows, and the unmarried daughters. He also, as head, succeed to, the, uh, to, to a considerable amount of authority over the other members, was, and, and it was given to the firstborn in the absence of the father. We, as the firstborn of God, have been given headship by the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is the head. He is the firstborn from the dead. As his body of the earth, we are directed by his headship as we are the church, the firstborn out of him, Christ, which is head over all things. And so we have to exercise that. That's Ephesians 2, verse 22 to 23. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And we have to learn how to exercise that as a body. The church, which is the firstborn, now has headship through the Holy Spirit. Do you see that? The church must have the mind of Christ to enforce the headship of the Lord Jesus Christ on the earth. You can't do it without having the mind of Christ. That's 1 Corinthians 2, verse 15 to 16. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For whom... For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. So we cannot exercise headship without the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ is not an individual, but it's in the body of Christ. Do you hear me? To know his mind, we must remain part of his body. Do you hear what I'm saying? To know him and to know his mind, we must be part of a local body. Headship is about making decisions. The firstborn had to make decisions for the family when the father was not around. We who are the firstborn on the earth must make decisions that display the wisdom of God. Reuben made a decision about Joseph, Genesis 37. Decisions are affected by different factors. There are things that would influence your decision-making capability. We who are the firstborn of God must firstly ask ourselves, Is this decision the will of the Father when you make it? Christ has been given authority. Why? To execute judgment. John 5, verse 26 to 27. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment also because because he is the Son of Man. So we have been given authority by the Lord Jesus to be as he was. That's what the scripture says. 1 John 4, 17. Love has been perfected amongst us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. So we must execute that headship as Jesus would have done it. And we have authority. We have the authority of the word. Matthew 8, verse 8. To nine, go read it. Where the centurion says, Lord, I'm a man of authority. You don't have to come to my house to heal my Just speak the word. We have the same. We have the authority to execute God's will in the earth. So we must understand that our rhema word from the Lord can change the entire situation in a blink of an eye. But you must believe what I just told you. Okay, let's go to the seventh benefit then of Goshen. The seventh one. He set aside the first to establish the second. Watch this. He set aside the first to establish the second. Genesis 48, verse 17 to 19. Now when Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand on the head of Ephraim, it displeased him. 
So he took hold of his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head, because Manasseh was the firstborn. And Joseph said to his father, not so, my father, for this one is the first one. Put your right hand on his head. Verse 19, but his father refused and said, I know, my son, I know. He also shall become a people, and he also shall be great. But truly, this younger brother shall be greater than he, and his descendants shall become a multitude of nations. Listen, God can switch things around. Watch this. Jacob uh, placed his right hand on Ephraim, who was the youngest son. The blessing of the patriarch was greatly valued in those days. Even today, I will show you just now. The principle was established in in Jacob placing his hand on Ephraim. Now, the definition of Ephraim, the name Ephraim means is double fruitfulness. Double. You see that? And the definition of the name Manasseh means to forget, actually to forget my pain. That's what it means. Joseph chose to forget the sufferings he endured and began to prosper in Egypt. God acts independently of the claims of priority based on time of birth when he chooses a man. Do you hear what I'm saying? God acts independently, okay? He too crosses his hands in the case of Seth, whom he chose and over Cain. Also Shem over Japheth. Also Isaac over Ishmael, Jacob over Esau, Joseph over Reuben, Moses over Aaron, David over all his brothers, and Mary over Martha. Through scripture, the whole scripture, Ruth was a Moabite, what was promoted in the genealogy of Christ. The disciples were untrained and uneducated, but spoke with boldness and supersede the Pharisees, which were trained by the best tutors and, and, and scholars. Goshen's principle, principles activated promotion and elevation. Promotion and elevation. When we position and align ourselves with the nature and character of God, we see elevation and promotion beginning to take place in our lives. In regard to Ephraim's blessing, he was placed before Manash and all things. Watch this quickly. And he blessed him on that day, and he placed Ephraim before Manash. Watch this now. He placed him first in the list of generations. First, in Numbers 1, verse 32, first he says, these are the generation of the sons of Ephraim. Then he says, and these are the generation of the sons of Manasseh. Do you see that? And also, he placed him first in the allotting of the tribal territories. He says, in Joshua 16, 8, this is the territory of the sons of Ephraim. Afterwards, he says, this is the territory of the sons of Manasseh. He puts him first when determining the tribal divisions. That's in Numbers 2, verse 18. The division of the camp of Ephraim will be like this. And afterwards, and alongside it, the tribe of Manasseh. Do you see that? He puts him first among the tribal chieftains who brought their dedicatory offerings to him. On the seventh day, the chieftains from the sons of Ephraim. You see? That's in Numbers 7, verse 48. And then afterwards, on the eighth day, the chieftains from the sons of Manasseh. That's in Numbers 7, verse 54. So he put him first among the judges. He says, Joshua was from Ephraim and Gideon from Manasseh. He put him first among the kings. Jeroboam was from Ephraim and Jehu from Manasseh. He put him first in the blessing to invoke by future generations. By you shall Israel invoke blessings, saying, God make you like Ephraim and Manasseh. You see that? He put him first with regard to the birthright. That is in Genesis 48, verse 20. God is a genius. You see that? Okay, the eighth blessing that comes from the benefit from Goshen is you are given a portion above your brothers. Genesis 48, verse 21, 22. Then Israel said to Joseph, Behold, I'm dying, but God will be with you and bring you back to the land of your fathers. Moreover, I have given to you one portion above your brothers, which I took from the hand of the Amorite with my sword and my bell. So Joseph was given one portion above his brother. The portion was he was given a piece of land as his inheritance. And remember, Joseph's bones were carried out of Egypt and were buried in that piece of land or ground that he received as an inheritance. That's in Joshua 24, verse 32. 
Also, you found later in Scripture in the New Testament that Jesus comes and he sits at that portion of land that Jacob gave to his son as inheritance. That is in John 4, verse 5 to 6. So Goshen reveals to us the portion and the inheritance we received in Christ. Now, under the law of Moses, God was the portion and the inheritance to the priest and to the Levites. God now becomes our portion. Do you hear what I'm saying? That's Numbers 18, verse 20. Then the Lord said to Aaron, You should have no inheritance in their land, nor shall you have any portion among them. I am your portion and your inheritance among the children of Israel. Hallelujah. Come on, what more do you want? What more do you want as a firstborn? Hallelujah. Deuteronomy 10, verse 8 to 9. And the time the Lord separated the tribe of Levi to bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord, to stand before the Lord, to minister him, and to bless in his name. To bless in his name. To bless in his name on, to this day. To this day. So the Levites need to bless in God's name. Therefore, Levi has no portion nor inheritance with his brethren. The Lord is his inheritance, just as the Lord your God promised him. Now, the definition of the word Levi means this, to be joined. To be joined. They were joined to the Lord. When we are joined to the Lord, he becomes our portion and our inheritance. We now bear the ark of the covenant because of the spirit of God that dwells in us. So you carry his presence wherever you go. As a people joined to the Lord, we are one with the Lord. Therefore, he is our portion and our inheritance. Go read Jeremiah 10, verse 16, where it says that Israel is the tribe of his inheritance. The Lord of hosts is his name. Psalm 73, verse 26. My flesh and, and my heart failed, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. My portion forever. In Ephesians 1, verse 11 and 12. In him also we have obtained an inheritance. Come on, you've an inheritance. You have an inheritance that you've obtained in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. The ninth one, the ninth blessing of Goshen. Are you still okay? Is patri a patriarchal blessing. Patriarchal blessing. Genesis 49, verse 1 to, 1 to 2. And Jacob called his sons and said, gather together, Jacob, watch this, called his sons, gather together that I may tell you what shall befall you in the last days. Watch this now. Gather together, verse 2, and hear, you sons of Jacob, and listen to Israel, your father. What is, what is God saying here? What is God saying here? Jacob gathers his sons, but Israel speaks over his sons. Israel was not speaking as a recipient. Uh, uh, Israel was now speaking as a recipient of covenantal promise. His words over his sons outline their destiny. He is not speaking as the, as the heel catcher, but as the one that has prevailed and ruled. Israel. His words are uttered in the land of Goshen. Goshen is the location of receiving patriarchal blessing that will define your destiny. Jacob went through, watch this. Jacob, Jacob went through a period of formation to be able to impart as Israel. Oh, my goodness. Sometimes God would put fathers through hell. Yes, to form you, squeeze you, shape you. So when you speak the blessing, it will be a patriarchal blessing. He spent 17 years, watch this. He spent 17 years in Egypt. And the length of his life was 147 years. In other words, it took 130 years of preparation before he could impart as a father. Do you see that? The, and that, when, watch this. And that formation was just for one moment of impartation. God knows exactly what he's doing. This moment and this blessing that would lead to the birthing of the nation of Israel and his 12 tribes takes place in Goshen. Goshen is a, is a position of receiving the blessing that will unlock your destiny. When we draw near to God and we draw near to those whom he has appointed as overseers of our souls or shepherds of the flock, then we see our divine purpose being unfolded. Elijah 
was positioned to receive the blessing from Elijah by following him and staying close to him. David blessed Solomon, who became the wisest and the wealthiest king. That we can find in 1 Kings 2, verse 1 to 3. And and when he says, uh, when he spoke to him, he said, keep the commandments, keep his judgments, uh, as it was written in the law of Moses, that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn. That is what David said to Solomon. And that was in 1 Kings 2, verse 1 to 3. And Jesus also commissioned his disciples in John 2, verse 21, 23. So Jesus said to them again, peace to you, as the Father has sent me, I also sent you. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Then he said the following, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. So we must learn how to position ourselves to receive this blessing. When we get married... We must receive the blessing of our parents. When we change jobs, receive the blessing of your previous employer. When you leave a church to join another church, we must receive the blessing of the pastor. When Elijah left to follow Elijah, he received the blessing of his community. Yes. Go read it in 1 Kings 19, verse 20 to 21. He slaughtered an ox and whatever, and they, they burned the, 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 the plow and everything, and they made a big barbecue, and he blessed everybody, and they blessed them. Job received the blessing of a perishing man and of a widow. That's in Job 29, verse 12, verse 13. Because I delivered the poor who cried out, the fatherless and the one who, who, had, not, who had no helper. 13, verse 13. The blessing of a perishing man came upon me, and I caused the widow's heart to sing for joy. Do you see that? Job 29, verse 12 to 13. Nabal, in his foolishness, did not know how to receive the blessing of David. Jesus told his disciples to dust their feet if a house or a city did not receive them. Dusting the feet was a symbol of judgment. When we receive those sent by the Lord, the peace of the Lord or the shalom or the blessing comes upon a city or a house. Matthew 10 verse 12 to 14. And when you go into a household, greet it. If the household is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it's not worthy, let your peace return to you. And whoever will not receive you, nor hear your words, when you depart from that house or that city, shake off the dust from your feet. Now, the tenth blessing or benefit from Goshen. The tenth one. We're nearly done. Are you still okay? Some homework, eh? You are protected from the plagues. When the land of Egypt came under the judgment of God, Goshen was a safe and protected place. No plague came near their dwelling because the Israelites stayed near to Joseph. There were no flies in Exodus 8, verse 22 to 23. That no swarm of flies shall be there in order that you may know that I am the Lord in the midst of the land. No loss of livestock. That's in Exodus 9, verse 4 to 6. So nothing shall die of all that belongs to the children of Israel. But of the livestock of the children of Israel, no one died. No hail. That's in Exodus 9, verse 25 to 26. No darkness in Exodus 10, verse 22 to 23. No death of the firstborn. That's in Exodus 11, verse 4 to 7. You can go read it. All Israel was regarded as the firstborn of God. We find that in Exodus 4, verse 22. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So Goshen humanizes us from the plagues of Egypt. It's a place of preservation, a preservation of posterity and possessions. Now the 11th benefit of Goshen. Here we go. It is favor. Favor. Come on, say amen. Amen. Exodus 11 verse 2 to 3. Speak now in the hearing of the people and let every man ask from his neighbor and every woman from her neighbor articles of silver and articles of gold. Verse 3. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. 
Moreover, the man Moses was, was very great in the land of Egypt, in the sight of Pharaoh's servants, and in the sight of the people. Do you see that? Also, Exodus 12, verse 35 to 31. The Lord given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptian. God had told Moses before his arrival, even before going into Egypt, he said that he will give the Israelites favor before their exodus. And that you find even in Exodus uh, uh, 3, verse 22, 21 to 22. He says, and I will give the, this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Go read the whole passage. So the fulfillment of those words took place in Goshen. Goshen is a spiritual position that activates the favor of God in your life. This favor is the graciousness of God in the midst of oppression. The Israelites received divine favor before the exodus from Egypt. As slaves, they were receiving silver and gold from the oppressors. God gave Joseph favor in Egypt. That's Genesis 39, verse 2 to 5. So Joseph found favor in his sight and served him. Go read that whole passage. Joseph had favor in the sight of his masters. This favor was because God was with him. This is the indwelling presence of God that gives us an unfair advantage in this world. Somebody say amen. amen. We refer to this favor as the grace of God. We receive favor in the sight of others. This means that favor can be seen and becomes a testimony to others. That's why your progression must become visible to others. Hallelujah. It was this favor that caused the house of Potiphar to prosper. It was this favor that made Joseph prosper in prison. Ruth had favor because of the honor she bestowed to Naomi and because of her pursuit and leaving her family and her land of birth. It's a father-son relationship. That you find in Ruth 2, verse 10 to 11. Why have I found favor in your eyes. Since I'm a foreigner. Go read that. The grace of God is multiplied. When we show. And honor. And have commitment. Favor is bestowed upon us. God's children. Because they remain faithful to the principles. Of the kingdom of God. Many people are not. Not faithful to the principles. 1 Samuel 2.26 Look at the favor of his life. And the child Samuel grew. Remember what was said of Jesus, but also of Samuel. And the child Samuel grew in stature and in favor, both with the Lord and with men. As Samuel grew up under the care of Eli in the house of God, he had favor with God and with man. The favor of God is extremely linked to us having favor with, the men, with men. Samuel respected and, honored, and showed honor to Eli, the priest, and that gave him favor among men. 1 Samuel 3, verse 3. And before the lamp of God went out in the tabernacle of the Lord, where the ark of God was, and while Samuel was lying down. So where was he? He was in the temple, close by. So when we grow in the house of God and lie in the presence of God as Samuel did, then the favor of God begins to work in our lives. Samuel was a righteous man, and none of his words fell to the ground. He was a highly respected prophet and judge in Israel. And that you find, Esther, look at uh, also the life of Esther. In Esther 2, verse 17 and 18. The king loved Esther more than all the other women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight, more than all of the virgins. So he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vasti. Then the king made a great feast, the feast of Esther, for all his officials and servants. And he proclaimed a holiday in the province and gave gifts according to the generosity of a king. All because of one woman of God. Esther enjoyed the favor under Persian rule. This favor allowed her to protect her people and her nation. God allows favor to come upon our lives, not just for personal gain but also for national interest. Do you see that? Now the last one. Who? The last one. It is the exodus from slavery to sonship. The exodus from slavery to sonship. Genesis 47 verse 11. And Joseph situated his father... And his brothers, and gave them a possession in the land of Egypt, in the best of the land, 
in the land of Ramses as Pharaoh had commanded. Then in Exodus 12, 37, then the children of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Sukkoth, about 600,000 men on foot besides children. So the children of Israel made an exodus from Egypt from Ramses. Goshen was situated in Ramses. Their exit or their flight, their departure, their migration or leaving was from this location in Goshen. While they were in Ramses, they became slaves and adopted the slave mentality through Egyptian oppression. To adopt a new mentality, they had to migrate out of Egypt as God's firstborn son. Do you see that? It was a migration from a slave mentality to a sonship mentality. They were no longer slaves of Egypt, but firstborn sons of God. The final benefit of Goshen is that it prepares to exit a slave mentality and adopt a sonship mentality where God is your heavenly father, your papa. The Passover and all its principles were, an, were a nation being born into a kingdom of God. They were no longer slaves of sin. They were now heirs of the promise. Romans 6, verse 16 to 18. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are the one slave whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. But God be thanked, though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart. Watch this. That form of doctrine. Oh, Lord Jesus, we need doctrine. To which you were delivered. And have been set free from sin, you become slaves of righteousness. So Goshen, drawing near, staying in proximity, being in range, matures us into sons that will go through the wilderness and eventually enter our promised land. As sons, we learn how to eat the manna, the proceeding word, which contains the substance of grace that will bring us to the divine intent of God. We receive provision, protection, promotion, patriarchal blessing, so that we can exit an Egyptian mentality and receive a sonship mentality. Israel was God's firstborn son and now carried the birthright. We who are in Christ must let Goshen prepare us for our departure from a slave mindset into a sonship mentality. Somebody say amen. Listen, people, we've got to get done with slavery. We are sons of God. God is about to elevate this mature son in the earth today. God is about to elevate him. God's about to show all these benefits manifesting in the life of God's firstborn son. That is you I'm speaking about. There are many of these benefits that now need to take place in your life, needs to manifest itself in your life so that others can see, can become a testimony to the glory of God for no other reason but for the glory of God. God is raising up a, a, a church in the earth, not one that struggles, a church without spot or ring, a bride, a beautiful, radiant, glorious, powerful powerful bride not a bunch of losers that's also always struggling to come by but ones that are living a life of victory overcomers in every circumstance no matter what life might throw at you no matter what circumstance might come your way but God will cause you to be this firstborn son that is exiting everything that's represented in Egypt promise going through the wilderness, whatever God wants to strip out of your life and from your life, preparing you for that promised land that God has prepared for you before the foundation of the earth. That is where we're heading. Listen to me. That is where we're heading. I feel God. That is where we're heading. Some of you need to start to believe it. Listen, the stuff that you struggled with in the past is over. God is going to make it easy because it's God and His divineness of His power that's going to cause all of this stuff to manifest in your life. But you and I need to adhere to the principles, the doctrine, the Word of God, position ourselves in Goshen so that all of this stuff can manifest in our lives. Father, we thank You for Your Word. 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 Come on. Thank you for your word. 
Thank you that we will be partakers of all of these benefits of Goshen. Every one of us, Father, thank you that none of us will miss out. But we will be partakers, partakers, partakers of the benefits of Goshen. Because we are now in the time of Passover. We are passing over. We are passing over. We are passing over. Out of the old into the new, into a freshness of God. Freshness of God. Newness of God. In Jesus' name. Nothing will hold us back, Father. Nothing will hold us back. I say nothing will hold us back. But we're breaking out of the old. And we're pressing into the new. Because of the benefits of Goshen. That now manifests itself upon God's firstborn son. And everybody say, Amen and Amen.